I know I'm supposed to deliver this in 15 minutes, and I'll try to keep all of us busy going through this. I am very excited about these results, and I want to talk about sleep um, that can occur indeed in a long space flight. So how I got involved in this particular research is a special story. And if I can get the... And that is um, after bumping into a friend of mine who at the time was still working for King's College London, Dr. David uh, Green, who now works for European Space Agency. And he was coming from a particular nice soiree where they were discussing particular designs of the Mars colonies and architecture. And I rather like the idea of going to soirees where the one is discussing what the um, particular huts and um, various spaces are going to look like in, 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 um, on Mars. Now, what Dr. Green has done at the time, sorry, I'm having a little bit of problem with that. He's also told me about a particular model that he's developed, and he was telling me about the research looking into the physiology of the changes that one experiences under conditions of microgravity and sensory deprivation. And indeed, um, the, the uh, uh, news um, over the last two years, especially with Elon Musk um, being in news for all sorts of reasons, but also for the right types of reasons of putting lots of funding into funding the flights to Mars and perhaps other colonies, are of interest and I think have to be taken seriously if we are ever to consider really to move a little bit further and use our imagination as humankind. Obviously, that all comes um, with a particular, if you want, Cold War element to it, and we're not going to go into politics apart from maybe a few very brief times during this talk, but as you can see, Chinese have already started on my birthday. Um, during this year, a special set of protocols that have been very top-notch, very secretive about, but where they're testing and they're really uh, undergoing various types of investigations very close to Beijing, looking into the changes when people are exposed to sensory deprivation and looking what the life really might be on different planets. Now, there has been several papers over the last two years showing that really there are changes to our brain that occur, not just our body if we were to spend prolonged periods of time or even shorter periods of time um, under conditions of microgravity. And there has been a particularly interesting paper recently that's been published and that showed that um, the brain changes um, during the conditions of microgravity. What we know is that there is so-called space adaptation syndrome and there are lots of reports and there are lots of books written by previous and past astronauts, which if you read, talk about the element of psychosis while they're exposed to these extreme conditions. Obviously, there is, element, uh, there is a, a worry about radiation and um, worry of various changes on your spine, on your bone density, but something that has been relatively recently recognized, that hasn't been re uh, recognized up until um, really um, a as recent as 2007, is the impact on the brain and functioning. And in 2007, um, NASA astronaut Lisa Novak um, was charged with attempted murder um, shortly following her um, trip to International Space Station, which after it was really looked properly into, um, resulted in the NASA Treat Act, which basically means that any um, interplanetary uh, travel has to undergo proper governmental regulations and that people who are going to undergoing or uh, astronauts have to be properly neuropsychiatrically and otherwise um, evaluated. So apart from these um, strange explanations of um, extra -reli religious feelings, psychosis, break of phenomenon, overview effect, hallucinations, as mentioned, we also have uh, impacts on the brain. Now, 
What do we know at the moment about the sleeping space? I think um, my colleagues uh, prior to this talk have beautifully talked about the basic mechanisms and the state of the art knowledge, and I'm not going to even try to um, try to emulate some of the talks that were presented. So here what you see obviously just a sort of presentation of the various neuronal circuitries which we think correspond to various productions of the frequencies we see during the sleep stages. What we currently know um, from the very uh, limited and very primitive studies of polysomnographies and EEGs um, done on the International Space Station is that in astronauts we could expect um, reduction in um, stage three, um, so slow wave sleep, and that there are slightly confusing reports regarding um, REM sleep, so there are some reports of um, increase and some reports in decrease. <coughs> What is clear, there is increase in insomnia and in sleep fragmentation under the conditions of extreme um, uh, uh, physiological conditions. Now, what about space research at the moment? As you can imagine, it's hugely expensive doing experiments on International Space Station and colleagues of ours in uh, United States, um, Professor Seisler and uh, Laura, Laura Barga, have done some research um, as a part of Neurolab protocols, but majority of the work is really done using the Earth-bound models. And at the moment, and this is the last political point, um, there are two major models that we utilize. So there is obviously German model, which is um, in order to implicate the changes that you are supposedly undergoing during conditions of microgravity, uses rather prolonged procedures where participants have to be exposed to this six um, degrees head down tilt up to 60 days. And there is a slight sort of difference in as much that obviously the changes in particular in CNS are not exactly as they would be under the conditions of flight. But it's a very good cardiovascular mimicry. So rather prolonged, uh, rather um, moderate, but a prolonged torture, if you <laughs> can imagine, for those participants. Now, there is a Russian model. Uh, it's a model of so-called dry immersion. Um, participants can't really cope with it for uh, uh, any longer periods of time. It actually, one week is probably far too long. It's several days. It's very poorly to tolerated, but it's a quite good model for changes that are occurring in central nervous system. So take your pick. What would you particularly like amongst those two models? So what my colleague, Dr. David Green, when he was coming back from those sorays, was thinking that he really rather fancied sort of um, middle way, Goldilocks way, neither too cruel but uh, quickly done with, neither perhaps not so cruel but prolonged. So he said there must be a model where we could do that, those type of changes perhaps with slightly better, which is resembling Goldilocks, not too, not too firm, not too uh, soft, but just right. And what he did, indeed, is come up what I think is rather um, ingenious, simple model, which mimics most pertinent um, effects of microgravity on the central nervous system, as well as German uh, system on cardiovascular. And here it's shown. So I'm not going to hang on it for too long because it's, the paper is about to be published, so then you're going to be able to get all the details. So this particular model um, is also of particular interest for clinicians because it's also a model of disuse, unloading, um, loss of hydrostatic pressure gradient, and um, just a really uh, observation of a prolonged period of time in neutral body posture. Now, what we have done, done um, we managed to persuade a few people to give us funding and we organized study where we use this particular Goldilocks model in order to look at the changes at muscle physiology, um, uh, spine, and in particular my group, Sleep City, was involved in looking into the changes in uh, brain structure, brain physiology, and sleep. So what we've done is slightly better uh, presented here is over seven days period, we investigated participants 
And what we did every day, we exposed them to quite a rigorous uh, procedure. They um, had uh, regular tests, cognitive tests in the morning, in the evening, emotional um, variability tests. And then um, they also had the various physiological tests, urine checking for the um, melatonin levels. We also did um, uh, every night. Uh, we've done polysomnography, high density polysomnography every evening. And here you can see, so um, 12 healthy athletic male participants with no known sleep neuropsychiatric comorbidities were selected. And during those seven days, they were allowed only 15 minutes of this particular um, flotation tank. And those were um, very, very strictly um, regulated for their personal hygiene. So there is a whole set of stories and short stories written by participants about their competition, how they managed to go to the toilet and have a shower within 15 minutes. Now, we also obviously made sure that all the physiological other factors were really looked after. So they, um, their meals were nutritionally balanced and um, they basically only ex had access to conventional media-based entertainment, iPads, but otherwise um, no visits were allowed apart from the uh, researchers. And um, uh, one particular um, special uh, present that we arranged for them was a visit by Mike Foale, who was really wonderful. For those of you that perhaps don't know, he is a British astronaut who um, was uh, really the first Brit to moonwalk. He did that for Americans, but um, is, is really someone to be very proud of. He, to this day, goes around and lectures and is trying to promote space medicine. Mike Foale was impressed uh, with this study to the point that um, he really thought we went into huge, huge um, effort to simulate sensory deprivation that he um, uh, realized, um, he told us, was uh, uh, present at Mir in 1980s without realizing that actually we have done absolutely nothing to the NHS sleep lab that we have. And effectively, uh, we simply, um, by the nature of using NHS facilities, uh, were able to uh, mimic the sleep deprivation. Now, I'll breeze through those, but feel free to ask me afterwards, even after the conference, and hopefully most of those papers should be coming out shortly. So the set of batteries of tests we've done uh, were very detailed, very sophisticated, and effectively the results um, that we got, and I'm not going to dwell on them too long, were sort of, if you want, three groups of results, and that is we were able to show that these three particular tests were significantly um, affected. So um, our participants over seven di uh, days really had a, um, a, a decrease in their reaction time, so in their uh, psychomotor um, uh, uh, facilities. They also had the reduced spatial working memory, so um, their visual spatial memory was affected, but that was actually by comparison to the control group. So both, uh, both groups were able to um, get some effect of the testing or practicing. However, the control that was uh, the group that was under microgravity conditions was poorer in um, learning um, capacity than obviously the control group. Now, what was interesting, what we found particularly uh, um, still unresolved, although we have some hypotheses, is that by com uh, compared to the control group that we had for the, only for the cognitive element of these tests, we found that our floater notes actually improved in verbal recognition memory. And here comes um, some of the things that I'm going to fly through of the results afterwards what really happens and what kind of homeostatic changes um, are occurring. Now, you can see here some of the results we found particularly exciting. And I work, and I'm, I'm quite fortunate that I work with the neuroimagers who are not particularly excited about clinical or physiological side of things. They like statistics. So when they got particularly excited about increases and decreases over seven days after very, very rigorous statistical uh, processing, then I realized we are on to something. So as you can see, nucleus accumbens was affected. We have a very nice um, uh, caudatum effect or putamen. 
what we found obviously i'm not going to even go into the brainstem that's still undergoing so you can see cingulate the gyrus in particular posterior what i found fascinating if you think about the motor cortex and for those of you that still remember neuroanatomy and if you think this is sort of where your hand knob is this is roughly corresponding to toes and if you remember that poor flotonaut I showed you there, so um, you can imagine that those are pro probably parts of anatomy that were uh, really not moved that much during those seven days. How fascinating these results really are, not to mention hippocampus. So um, we, we really, uh, these are particularly statistically rigorously done. Now, what we've done from then, again, breezily through another very, very clever postdoc, Dr. Veronese, um, we wanted to see how possibly we could look into the genes that might be underlying some of these changes. Obviously, we couldn't do the brain biopsies. Um, I don't think our flotonauts would have done that, although they sacrificed quite a lot over those seven days. So what we've done, we use the Allen Brain Atlas and um, using a rather clever software, we looked into the integration of really neuroimaging changes and already known mRNA and, and freely available brain expression maps for, from uh, uh, Brain Atlas. And what we found, having looked through myriad of tests, or genes, neuroplasticity, neuroinflammation genes, um, two genes, only came out significant, and that is neuroplastin gene and RASGRP1 gene. Now, again, you might have not heard about neuroplastin. I have a two colleagues here from Croatia who are working on it. It's a really new hot kid on the block. There is a lot to be uh, uh, said about it in relation to uh, IQ, synaptic, uh, synaptic pl plasticity, um, Basically, any homeostatic change, any plastic change in brain seems to be connected with neuroplastin. Again, interestingly, neuroplastin has also been, uh, as you've seen from the papers, that are connected with a memory, and it seems that somehow influencing switching it on and off can erase memories. I'm not going to um, dwell on it too much, what I will say, that the RASGRP1 gene, which I thought, why, uh, what is this about, might be another very, very interesting finding from this study. So funnily enough, you've seen how much uh, basal ganglia were affected. This particular gene is found to regulate a small molecule called RES, or RES gene, and protein that, that uh, comes out of it, that regulates dopamine at the level of basal ganglia. And it's involved in a um, variety of neurodegenerative disorders, especially motor disorders. And I wonder how much this perhaps underlies some of the changes that we, we might be seeing in people, um, again, after the prolonged uh, sleep deprivation or um, uh, disuse and dismobility when it comes to their moving, including what colleague just was talking about, sleep apnea. Now, we also showed a connection between basal ganglia changes and those two tests, which again uh, point to the importance of the limbic uh, basal ganglia. Now, neurophysiology. Um, this work is currently being finalized as a part of Dr. Uh, Mr. Tsai's, hopefully soon Dr. Tsai's work. So we've been able to replicate uh, some of the findings from um, uh, Laura's uh, Neurolab studies. We found that um, sleep parameters in particular, stage three, have been significantly reduced over seven days, and this is really uh, quite nicely replicated um, over seven days. What we did find, however, there is increase in REM and there is increase in sleep fragmentation. Again, work done by Dr. Nyoni um, showed that, that there are changes, local changes in slow wave activity, uh, most uh, significantly in REM and uh, uh, N3. And now something completely different, just for the end. So um, new postdocs started with a group and he's a mathematician, and as we gave him the task to play with spectral analysis, he did that, and he came very excitedly showing that there is a huge difference, this is obviously just one of the examples, between the first and the last night. And this is not the best uh, analysis, obviously, this was just one of the first starts, but what's fascinating, if you see the background noise here, and you see here the nice pillars, what 
we re then realized is that he didn't do what he was expected to do because obviously he didn't know we don't believe in frequencies below one hertz. So effectively, just by serendipitously not doing what physiologically we would have done when we filter EEG, he's found out that there are huge differences between first and last night in what, if you want epsilon or under one hertz uh, frequencies. Now, when we looked at the polysomnogram and when we looked at the spectral analysis, this is the example of the first night, we realized that these particular differences were in particular uh, present during REM sleep. And when we looked into it slightly better, we realized that this is, again, really, really uh, relating to the frequencies under one hertz. Now, what is that about? And I'm not going to say that I have the answer. What I'm going to just mention is the paper and some of the work by our Russian colleagues, in particular my friend um, Vadim, who recently published this paper, which I think really should be read, in particular given that some new results from preclinical work are coming from fascinating Dr. Wu's optogenetic work, um, where he is showing that these ultra-low frequencies might be the frequencies that are so crucial into spreading and if you want sampling and into the sort of what consciousness might be. Now, what is the mechanism? What is their source? We don't know. Is it respiration? Is it really neuronal activity? Is it cardiovascular elements? What is interesting, and this is just really very preliminary, when we started doing our uh, resting state functional analysis, what we found when we did so-called ALFFF uh, um, uh, analysis in order to look at that frequency, we found two particular hotspots, one in central median nucleus and one in visual uh, 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 cortex. And then we got very excited by um, Julio's and Ciclari and Francesca's paper, where they were looking really to um, see whether so tooth, which some people think might represent PGO waves during REM wave, can do something with the low frequencies. And then Dr. Nioni has only recently looked into using the same software, the same sort of definition of so tooth, or so called, if you want to kind of take that leap of faith, PGO activity. And indeed, we've realized that I, by comparison to the first night, the last night shows really, really reduced PGO activity. So if you, again, want to take a leap of faith, phasic activity, phasic REM activity. Now, this is what we've seen, how it correlates to epsilon or those very ultra low frequencies. Again, we see that there is a huge decrease in correlation and we see that there is actually decrease in which one comes uh, first or which one comes last. Now, as I say, this has been very, very brief and um, there is a yet a lot to come from this particular study, but I think what, what's quite obvious, this study aside, but looking into most of the studies that are coming within the last two years, is that brain is very plastic, and that even the smallest uh, interference with the sleep and with the conditions under which sleep occurs, or indeed under which we are awake, makes changes and uh, correlates to neuroanatomical changes. So thank you very much for your attention.